Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, if you're enjoying the knowledge nuggets I'm dropping in my shows and just digging what I'm screaming here, then smash that like button and subscribe. And then spread the word to all your friends about the best wine show anywhere. This year, I was contacted about reviewing sherry. I thought, why not? In addition to that, I'll be pairing each of these sherries with food. I've got a lot of stuff to cover here, so I'll be giving you the summary versions of things with links in the description to go deeper. As I talked about in my Thanksgiving and Halloween specials, please celebrate safely. Follow uh, the CDC guidelines regarding the pandemic. Keep any gathering small, ideally just your household. If you do have guests, then they should have effectively been in a bubble. That is, they don't interact with others outside that bubble other than you. That doesn't mean they can't run errands. They just shouldn't be socializing with anyone other than you. All right, so let's get into how to incorporate sherry into your holiday meals. First, what is sherry? Well, it's kind of complicated, but I'll try to, to simplify it. At its most basic, sherry is a fortified wine that comes from the region of Andalusia, which is in the southwestern part of Spain near the city of Jerez. There are a total of 12 types of sherry. Some of the most familiar are Fino, Manzanilla, Amontillado, and Cream. They can range from bone dry to very sweet. After the grapes are harvested, there are two presses of grapes. Now, the first press becomes a Fino or Manzanilla. Now, Manzanilla is a variety of Fino sherry made around the port of San Lucar di Barameda. The second press becomes Oloroso. From these two main types comes everything else. The wines are fermented dry and only get to about 11 to 12% ABV. The wines are then sampled and the winemaker makes the determination what direction to take with each wine. It's at this point the wines are fortified using a wine distillate called uh, Distillado and it's put into 500 liter casks of North American oak. Now these casks are then put into a Solera system to age. The Solera system is a fractional blending system where the youngest wine is on the top and the oldest is on the bottom. Anywhere from 5 to 30% of the wine is removed from the bottom casks and is replaced with the same amount of younger wine from the next level up. This is repeated until you get to the top. Now, this system means that wine from many decades earlier will make it into a bottle depending on when the Solera was started. Some sherries are more oxidized than others. Fino and Manzanilla are aged under a cap of yeast called Flor. It protects the wine for several months during the year. Once the bottle has been opened, it should be drank fairly quickly, ideally no more than a day or so after opening, at most one week. Fino should also be served chilled. Depending on who's telling you, it should be anywhere from 40 to the low 50s degree Fahrenheit. And Oloroso is usually fortified to at least 17% ABV, which kills off the yeast. Olorosos will slowly oxidize as they progress through the Solera system. Cream sherry starts out as an Oloroso. Oloroso doesn't develop floor, so it's very oxidized. It is then sweetened with a naturally sweet wine known as Pedro Jimenez, or just concentrated grape must. It can have a sugar content anywhere from 115 to 140 grams per liter, and the alcohol can range anywhere from 15.5 to 22% ABV. Once opened, a cream sherry can last several weeks to months since the sugar acts as a preservative. A cream sherry can be served slightly warmer than a fino, low to mid 50s Fahrenheit. I highly suggest checking out the outstanding website, Sherry Notes. It is one of the best, if not the best resources out there on sherry. So what about the two I have here? I've been lucky enough to get two sherries from Gonzales Bias. They were founded in 1835 in the city of Jerez uh, by Manuel Maria Gonzalez Angel and his English agent, Robert Blake Bias. Now, they are one of the most well-known and respected sherry bodegas in Spain. They have expanded over the years to 14 wineries in Spain, Chile, and Mexico. They also produce spirits. 
let's get into the stats for both wines right now. First, it's the Tio Pepe Fino by Gazal's Bias. It's suggested retail price is $14.40. Okay, the type is Fino. It's 100% Palomino for the grape. It's aged four to five years in American oak via the Solera system. 15% is the ABV. Its pH is three. The total acidity is four grams per liter. The VA, the volatile acidity, we don't normally get this in a wine, but they provide it in their text sheet, is 0.2 grams per liter of lactic acid. That's how they measure VA, how much lactic acid is there. The residual sugar is less than one gram per liter and is considered, or it's actually certified vegan. All right, next is the Gonzalez Bias Solera 1847. The suggested retail price is $30. The type is cream sherry. Now, the grapes are 75% Palomino and 25% Pedro Jimenez. It's aged an average of eight years in American oak via the Solera system. Its ABV is 18%. The pH is 3.4. Total acidity is 5.7 grams per liter. Its VA is 0.6 grams per liter of lactic acid. And its residual sugar is 128 grams per liter. So this is going to be sweet. The way this wine is made is that the Oloroso and Pedro Jimenez wines are actually made separately and aged in separate Soleras for about four years. Then they're combined and then aged for an additional four years in the 1847 Solera. Now, I'm not sure why exactly it's called 1847, though it implies that the Solera started in 1847. Anyway, let's get into the wines. Now, the... Uh, I got my Corvin, I got everything I need for Corvin, but I'm pretty sure this is like a plastic top and then like a cork on it on both of them. So um, they gave me a half bottle, which is great because I don't know how fast I'm going to finish this sherry. I'm really excited about doing this because uh, the idea is that, um, I mean, I'll get into this when I get into the charcuterie and all that, but to start and end your, your Christmas meal, with a uh, with a sherry, so yeah, as I suspected, it's um, you know it's a plastic cap, and then it's got a cork, and it's got a little cork, so no corvin for this. I'll probably same thing for that. All righty, I'm gonna give myself a healthy pour because I am gonna be pairing this with um, pairing this with the food here. All right. Bam. Super excited to do this. All right, so right off the bat, as, as usual with a fino sherry especially, you get this nutty characteristic, really a, a very much almond and almond skin. Um, there's, you know, you get this actual bitterness on, on the nose. I also get like a little bit of wet concrete. Um, almost like you're at the, you're at the pool and, I, and that may sound like it's a negative thing, but it's not. Um, I tend to, I personally tend to get this type of pool smell from Sherry and just in general, not just this one, uh, at least the Finos. Um, but a little bit of what we would call petrichor, so like just the wet concrete from rain and, and the ionization, right? So you get a little bit of that. I'm guessing you get a little bit of dried fruit. Possibly a, a, a some type of fig. And um, yeah, there's all this aroma. I mean, it really is kind of like, you know, going to the pool. Or just like going to the river and you have the river rock and you get the smell of the river, a little bit of moss. Yeah, I mean, it's mostly like the, the that kind of nuttiness because while it's not super oxidized, it does have a bit of oxidation. The floor does, um, the floor also affects the aroma and flavor of the of the wine because it's a layer of yeast and it's it's um, it survives by like basically taking up anything that's in the actual wine. And there's a special thing that's, it's not, exclusive to that part of Spain, but that particular floor is, but other areas of the world will have same or similar wines that exhibit this type of um, cap. All right, let's, uh, let's get into the wine.
it's light, it's bitter. You get that that almond, you get that nuttiness, that peanut, that cashew, just like a collection of nuts. Like you have a mixed nuts type of thing. And that's how it starts out. And it's actually really smooth and easy to drink. It's it's not, I mean, uh, what was the alcohol? Like, uh, thir- uh, sorry, 15%. It doesn't feel like a high alcohol wine. Now, I didn't really mention about the Fino. Um, I mean, I mentioned it with this one, but the reason they, they fortify it to 15% or so is to kill the yeast. So it stops any type of fermentation. But it's also fermented dry. A little bit of orange blossom to it. A little bit of like that bitter orange peel. Yeah. Getting that river rock, that kind of mossiness. Uh, um, yeah. I think it's really the first time I've actually sat down and just completely analyzed the sherry. Normally, it's kind of smell it and drink good. Oh, smells nutty and tastes nutty, and that's all I get out of it, right? There's something else I'm, I'm kind of missing, and I, I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of like a new car smell, kind of like the, like a new leather seats, like just freshly tanned leather. Yeah, that's what I'm really getting on on kind of the the, the retro nasal when, when we're tasting it. So super super like just easy to drink, and uh, a great way to kind of start your your little meal off, whether it's going to be for Christmas or anything else. Now, let's get into the cream sherry. And this is a type of sherry that I really don't have a lot of experience with. So I'm super excited to do this. I mean, I've had just straight up Pedro Jimenez. Um, but as far as a cream, it's been pretty rare for me to have uh, a cream sherry. So you can see this really, it's got this really dark color to it. And that's really from the oxidation. And then I'm going to assume that the Pedro Jimenez helps with a little bit of the color on that. So with this, you can smell like this caramelization. Um, it's not, it, it's like the caramelization of, of oxidation and, and not, well, a little bit of heat, right? But it's not like these wines are cooked. Um, however, if I remember correctly, in, I'm not sure about these guys specifically, but in general, these aren't necessarily temperature controlled. I mean, they're, they're, it's wooden casks. So it's not like, you know, being put into like a, a stainless steel has all the temperature control on it. And I mean, I, I don't think it's not like a Madeira where it's like a hot box, but yeah, it's not like it's super temperature controlled, but yeah, you get this like caramelization, this, this not quite burnt sugar, but you have that caramelization. Uh, you still get a little, you get that oxidative note to it. It's not as nutty as the Fino, but it's, it's kind of like a, um, kind of like a roasted almond but it's, or, or, uh, but this uh, like a sweetened almond, sweetened pecan, butterscotch, absolutely butterscotch. Butterscotch and caramel for days. And then kind of like those sweet almonds, like those, those blue star almonds that you can get that are kind of, you know, kind of sweet and flavored, I guess. So, yeah, I know. Um, anyway, in some ways, it's like a tawny port. So it's definitely not as bitter as the Fino Sherry. It's really smooth, easy to drink. Um, you don't feel the alcohol. And this thing's 18%. You don't feel the alcohol. Like with ports, even with tawny ports, I mean, it's using the 20% range. You can really feel the alcohol a lot of times in port, especially like Ruby ports. But this, I'd be like... Well, it's not, where's the alcohol, man? So that's a, that's a way to say it's really well integrated. It's also pretty chilled. I mean, I, I, I had them out for a good 20, 30 minutes out of the free, out of the refrigerator. So they, they have warmed up a little bit.
but you do get this big and date and kind of this fruit cake type of thing. We're going to get to that in a little bit when I do some food pairing, but you get those types of, of flavors. There is a bit of nuttiness to it. You'll get a little bit of almond, a little bit of pecan and, um, and that's in a sweetened version of it. And you, you get that butterscotch, that caramel, all that kind of stuff. It's very delicious. All right. So what is on my charcuterie plate? So what I did is I went to a specialty supermarket in town and I bought a bunch of Spanish stuff to put on this plate. Now there's a few things that are not Spanish. The honey and the mustard aren't Spanish because we already had them at home. I didn't see the need to buying in that. Uh, the little bit of uh, jelly or jam or compote is, is not uh, Spanish. And then these little toasts uh, are not Spanish either, but everything else, the meats, the cheeses, the olives and the almonds are all from Spain. So we have the Campo Frio Chorizo Clasico, a Spanish pork sausage flavored with paprika. Now it's similar to pepperoni, which is pork and beef with paprika. And I spent $3 on that for a quarter pound. Next we have the Monte Nevado Jamón Serrano. It basically means mountain ham. I didn't know that until today. It's aged anywhere from 15 to 20 months. The most basic description of this is it pretty much looks and tastes similar to Italian prosciutto, or prosciutto as we would say. Uh, it is $6.96 for the quarter pound that I bought, so it's not inexpensive. Uh, the next thing I have is the El Pastor de la Polvorosa Iberico cheese, right here. It's a Spanish cheese made from a mixture of cows, sheep, and goat's milk. Now that came out to $4.10 for a fifth of a pound. Over here, we have the Don Juan 12-month Manchego cheese. Manchego is a name-protected cheese, which may only be made in Spain's central La Mancha region and only from the milk of Manchega sheep. Spent eight bucks on it for four-tenths of a pound. Over here, I have the Amundeli Marcona almonds. Uh, they're only from Spain. They're lightly fried in oil and salted, so a third of a pound costs $7.70. Then I've got the... Barnian mentequilla, which means butter in Spanish, at least that's what I was told. Uh, these are olives. They're also from Spain. $5.89 for six tenths of a pound. The jam here is the Blackberry Patch Blueberry Lemon Thyme Fruit Preserve, made in Georgia, as in the state. For, it was $3.99 for a two ounce jar. Again, not inexpensive. And then I've got the Divina Traditional Mini Toast from France, $2.49 for a eight ounce, for a 2.8 ounce package. So my total spend was $42.13. All right. And then I just have a no-name honey. I really don't know what the honey is. It's, it's just in a, it's like in a container. And then Goulden's mustard for a brown mustard. We already had that. So let's try the pairing. This is all going to be with the Fino. All right. I'm going to do the, the, the one we do the first is the Marcona almonds. Now, Marcona almonds are really, really tasty. Um, these, you have that little bit of oil, a little bit of salt. And right off the bat, that's like, a, you know, a match made in heaven. I didn't really talk about any type of brine or saltiness on the on the Fino Sherry, but it is there too. And the almond, since it's already got that almond flavor to it, and the salt and the oil and all that is just a really, really good combination. All right, so next we're going to do is we're going to do uh, the cheese. I'm going to do the Iberico first. And I, w I went with this Iberico just because it was Iberico. I really wanted Iberico ham, but the place I bought it at only had these only had two different types of Spanish meats. They used to have Iberico ham, but they end up with the the um, Serrano jamón or Iberico. You know, instead of Iberico jamón, it's Serrano jamón. So. The cheese has a bit of saltiness to it, and it's it's a hard cheese, so it's got some really firm texture to it. It's really got this really good combination of just, just flavors. I'm not really good at describing cheese. I mean, it tastes like cheese, but there's like this, it's not a creaminess, but there's like a, I, it, I, I don't know how to describe it, because I, I, don't, I don't do cheese tasting ever. I just taste the cheese and go, it tastes good, but... 
I mean, it's because I know there's three different milks in there, but it feels like there's a mixture of stuff in there. Um, it kind of feels like there's more cow than anything else. And that might be actually, I, I don't, it's not a third, third, third. I think it is more cow than anything else, but it kind of has that kind of cow milk or more of like, like, like a, like a dairy taste to it rather than any other type of milk. Um, but there is a bit of saltiness to it. All right. So now we're going to do the, um, manchego. I think the manchego is a little bit better pairing with it. Manchego is also like a, a higher end cheese. It's got that bit of creaminess though to it. It's got the saltiness. It's got that bitterness. So it really pairs well with that. But there's like this kind of softer cream type of, of flavor and, and mouthfeel to it. These are both hard cheeses and I would suggest to use hard cheeses with this sherry just because you have some structure to it. I mean, I guess you could put, I guess, if you really want any cheese, you can put any cheese if you want. But I would say a hard cheese is probably a better option with it. Now, let's do, uh, we're going to do the chorizo. That really accentuates the paprika in there and just the meat quality of it, that sanguine type of flavor and just the saltiness of it. That's real, that's, actually, I kind of like that pairing. This this chorizo is actually really good. And I didn't under, I didn't actually realize that pepperoni was seasoned with paprika, and I also didn't know chorizo was. I just knew it was, well, I knew it was Mexican sausage, but it's really a Spanish sausage. Basically, it is Spanish pepperoni, except it's all pork rather than pork and beef. And then um, I'm gonna do the jamón. Similar to the chorizo, but it doesn't have that sanguine, that 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 as, as much as that meatiness, as much as that kind of salty type of characteristic. I didn't mention that this ham is cured with salt, so you're going to get that brine characteristic with it. The texture is really nice. I mean, the texture of this is is, is smoother. And since it's not spicy like the like the chorizo is kind of spicy, not like bad, not like super spicy, but you know the paprika makes you know it's there. But there's no spices with this one, so in some ways it's a, it's a little bit uh, smoother and more even pairing. Now, last thing I'm gonna do is gonna do the the olives. I totally get it. I mean, the from how I understand, the classic thing is olives, almonds, mainly Marcona, sherry. And then you do things like sardines. I don't eat seafood, but anything that's kind of salty and briny, you really want to put with this. Both these cheeses have a bit of saltiness to it. Um, the chorizo, I think, has a little more... Well, actually, the Iberico has a little more... I'm sorry, the not Iberico. The jamón has a little bit more brine to it, a little more saltiness to it. The paprika, the, the paprika is really what you get that spicy characteristic from the chorizo. They all work, work really well. Just for kind of giggles, I'm going to do the little uh, preserve here. It works, actually. There's a really good kind of contrast there. It kind of softens the, the sweetness of the preserve of the jam, the jelly, whatever you want to call it. And adds like this little bit of like seasoning to it, like a little bit of saltiness to it. And I mean, it's kind of a cool little thing with the lemon and the thyme and the blueberry. I tried it on its own. I was like, yeah, it's okay. But this combination works, works well. I had I have, I have actually tried all these in advance before I sat down. I mean, I didn't try them at the store. I tried them when I got home and all of them are really good. So yeah, I'm not gonna go through like pairing honey and all that, but just know that honey and mustard and that type of stuff is a lot of times usually on your charcuterie plate. All right, 
Now for the cream sherry, I'm gonna stop recording and I'm gonna go grab the sweets I'm doing and I'll explain why I had to do that. Now for cream sherry, you can drink it on its own for dessert or even better, pair it with some sweets. The suggested pairings include fruit cake and vanilla ice cream. Dark chocolate is also a suggestion out there. So what am I pairing with this sherry? All right, so I bought, again, I bought this stuff over at the specialty supermarket. So the first thing I've got here is the fruit cake, which was made in-house, $3.59 for a four ounce portion of it. Next, I have the Matika Fig Almond Cake. This is also called Pan de Ego in Spain. It is a type of sweet that's handmade in Valencia, Spain of Pajarero figs and Marcona almonds. Now this costs a total of $4.08 and it was 0.355 pounds. The uh, next item I have here is the Chocolate in Love Rich Dark Chocolate. It's 71% cocoa from Peru and the, the Dominican Republic. It costs $4.49 for an eight ounce bar. I really couldn't find any Spanish chocolate. I mean, they had chocolate from Central and South America, but I was looking for chocolate from Spain itself. This is actually made in Switzerland. So the total cost of these sweets was $12.16. I also have an ice cream sandwich here. Now I came, it's a local supermarket brand. I don't know how much the box of 12 costs, but I needed vanilla ice cream and already had this in the house. So I didn't see the point in buying vanilla ice cream. All right, let's see how all this pairs together. All right, so I'm gonna do the regular fruit cake first. We've got all these spices and basically I have two fruit cakes here. Yeah, I mean it's just like a it's just a piling on of each other. So the fruit cake's got that kind of almost like that caramelized or, or burnt sugar thing going on with, with the actual cake itself. Got a little bit of fig to it. Um, got a little date to it. And, and the wine is basically just an enhancement of everything that's there. The wine is adding a little bit of butterscotch and stuff like that. But it is definitely a um, an enhancement. Now, we're going to do the Pan de Ego. See, I didn't stumble on it that time. I think probably because I wasn't reading the teleprompter. <laughs> I should do one with a little more of the the fig in it. So this was a little more subtle. The the pun de ego wasn't so over the top of that fig and that just sweetness to it. The almonds kind of help balance things out, and then you put it with and you put it with the sherry, and it's like this really even keeled pairing. You got a good balance between it. I'm not saying that the the fruit cake itself didn't balance well with it. That was more like you took the two the two components and you enhanced it. Where this was kind of like they they didn't get they didn't necessarily enhance each other. They complemented each other. All right. So the dark chocolate. I didn't try the chocolate ahead of time. I tried the others. Ahead. I didn't try the fruitcake. Well, I did try a little bit of fruitcake ahead of time. So what's cool about this is this dark, co the dark chocolate is fairly bitter. It's not super bitter, but it's fairly bitter. The sweetness, the sugar from the sherry it's kind of balancing. It's almost like having like the milk chocolate you, you would mix with the dark chocolate to balance it out. I think this has a, a little bit of milk chocolate in it. I, I don't remember. Maybe I'll put something in the lower third to tell you or I'll show you the picture of the of the um, packaging, though I kind of destroyed it. Anyway, there's like a good balancing act with that. It kind of like, it kind of not cancel each other out, but they, they balance each other out. It's really tasty. And it's like it's like you just took like the chocolate and just put it on top of everything. All right, now the ice cream sandwich. 
I've been eating a lot of these lately. Now, one of the things you could do, and I didn't do it because I didn't get natural vanilla ice cream, is you take vanilla ice cream and you pour this over it. But we're just going to do it this time. So I got chocolate and vanilla, right? So what's cool about this pairing, it's, it's like I just described. It's like as if you had taken this caramel, this kind of sweet caramel, caramelized fig type of syrup that's not too sticky, and you poured it on top. You, you know, imagine that's the combination. I mean, granted, it's not exactly like that. I've had some beers recently that I've paired with chocolate ice cream. Same concept. It's usually like a cherry type of flavor to these things. This is different. This has like that fig and date type of an apricot. Yeah, apricot type of stuff. And it's just like really kind of sugary and you pair it with that. It's it's really delicious. So yeah, I had something else in the script. I just let it just scroll. So you'll see, a, 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 you'll see definitely this little break that I just did. But you see jump cuts now for me all the time. Anyway, that's it. That's going to do it for the show. Um, I hope you liked what I did here. It's not my traditional Christmas thing or even a traditional Christmas like dinner pairing. It's honestly the Thanksgiving episode. You could just put Christmas in it and it's basically the same thing. To me, Christmas and Thanksgiving wines are almost always the same because we tend to eat the same types of food, at least in the United States for both these holidays. So yeah. But yeah, I'm just really excited. I've got my charcuterie. I've got my desserts. I already had dinner a while ago, so I don't know if I'm going to eat all these. But yeah, that's going to do it for today's show. Again, if you enjoy what I'm doing here, just make sure you hit that like button and subscribe. And then tell your friends. And until next time, we'll see you later.